For all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great Jane Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys recommended you. Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. You were t- I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, nah, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, one of my favorites to have ever covered and everywhere I've been back in those media days has the best head of hair, really just exposed us to the culture of the Tongan culture, that being Pat- Patrick Vahe. Uh, it seems like it's been an eternity, but it's only been a few years, Pat. Man, what are you doing these days? And, and is, this has got to be one of the, the best moments of this week or month to enter the man cave I, i'm just assuming that <laughs> oh of course oh <laughs> i love entering the man cave heard so much about it so <laughs> glad to be here <laughs> hey absolutely it's uh we've got a, a lot to talk about but mainly the best part of it is your is your your family the culture the ties because those guys your entire family and you can see his photos on social media on the twitter site Instagram, and of course, on the podcast Facebook page. But before we get going, uh, this episode brought to you by Honest AC and Plumbing. These guys are true, just true guys from throwbacks. They they believe in the handshake, and they're all about giving you the best service and quality service. And right now is probably a good time because we all know about that Texas heat. It's relentless. Mm-hmm. Get your AC service before it's too late. Uh, you don't want to be stuck when it's 100 degrees and have zero AC or plumbing issues when there's all that water that goes through an AC. So contact the guys at Honest AC and Plumbing. So episode 134 with Patrick Vahe. You just saw that video that I put up. I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that was right after you guys beat OU and you beat OU twice during your career at Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, the the roots of that. I mean, we saw that back in your days at Euless Trinity. It was because that's a significant Tongan Polynesian uh, population there. That dance. I mean, did you during your four years at Texas? How long did it take to recruit others to get involved in that dance? Oh man, like I think it was ever since my freshman year when I first showed up, people were just asking what I was. I was just like, oh, you know, I'm Tongan and Samoan. They're like. Oh, you the people that do the hockey? And I was just like, <laughs> yep, we're the people that do the hockey. That's that's pretty much the stereotype right there. Yeah, that's me. That's me. <laughs> and so ever since they found that out, they're just like, you got to teach us. We, we got to go out to one of the games and we all got to do it at once. And I was just like, oh, yeah, you know what? I, I can see what I can do. I can see what I can do. But <laughs> that video, that was my freshman year. Freshman year. Yeah. So that was after we beat OU. We just got into a locker room, and I remember one of the coaches was just like, "You got to do it right now. You have to do it right now." I was just like, "Who talking about?" Like, I'm I'm hyped, adrenaline pumping through my veins. I was like, "One like we I just won like as a team we won the game that I always saw growing up." And it was just like, it was just like, "You got to do it right now, right here, right now." So he started like spreading everybody out the way, and then they're all just looking at me. I was just like. You know what? Yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. And I started hitting everybody. The funny part was about that video was that was that that was like 
not even half of the whole entire thing. Like I just ended up getting to like a quarter of it and everybody just went crazy after that. And then I was just like, you know what? Okay. That's good enough for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> they got the sample and they probably would, would, you know, approach you to try to learn how to do it. And you know, one thing about it is, is, you know, we'll, Euless Trinity State Powerhouse that you came from, and, and and for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Pat was one of the top offensive linemen in the entire country, and Euless Trinity was known for producing some not just big offensive linemen, but for some reason you guys were skilled, and you could move <laughs> for a big guy. I've never seen a number a seventy seven jersey move like that before, and. If you go to Pat's, uh, I believe it, I can't remember if it's your IG account or Twitter, you posted a picture a while back of you back in high school. You were a, I, I guess you hadn't hit your growth spurt yet. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Slim that, Shady. Yeah, with well, that one, it was like, the re- I, I want to say personally, the reason why Trey always produced a lot of big people that were very agile and very skilled yeah. is because, that was, that was just the way we all grown up. Yeah. A lot of our families, we we come in in numbers. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so, like, whenever we come in numbers, we we tend to meet. Like, it was about it was bound by destiny that we're gonna grow up together. And that's pretty much what it was. Like, junior high, like we put, we try to play every single position that we can, Amazing. and play every single sport that we can. Always hanging out, like playing pickup football. You know what I mean? Playing basketball at the rec center or something like that. It was always something that we were always doing together. And that one thing was just always being active. Like there was never a day where this was before like technology just started blowing up. Right, right. There was never a day where we wouldn't go outside and play and then have to be back before the sun is down. Like we were always outside. We were always active. And then as soon as we get out to the football field, we're all together. It was just like you you seen it. that's pretty much our childhood right there was just playing. The whole entire time that's pretty you know amazing because that you know there's you don't see much of that anymore with kids of all backgrounds you don't see them much outside anymore but for those i i want you to help me correct me if i'm wrong on this story regarding uh the the tongan polynesian samoan families why Euless, texas what my what i was told was american airlines had a direct flight Mm-hmm. from the islands in the South Pacific to yep. DFW. Is that how it all started? Yeah, it was, that's pretty much how it was. Like, we had the first Tongan, um, pretty much the first person to represent Tongans coming to the States. And the first job that he was able to land was at the airport. And the crazy thing was, it was like, as soon as he figured out that we were able to all move over there, it was just yeah. like our connection was just flying there. You know what I mean? And so, like, it wasn't just DFW. It was all the major airports that you can possibly think of. So you're talking about, like, Salt Lake City. You're talking about yeah. LAX. You're talking about Miami. Like, you, any any big airport that you could think of, you're bound to find a Polynesian that worked there. <laughs> like, that, like, that's how it was. That was our gateway to move from the islands to the mainlands. It was just being able to migrate our families over so that we could be able to have at least a better opportunity that we would have had if we were still on island. You know what I mean? And, and you guys, the Tongan culture, um, some of the most loyal, I mean, I have a couple of friends who are Samoan and some of the most loyal people and largest families I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, man, if I could be re- if I could do it over again, no offense to my family. I love my family, but <laughs> Man, those are big time, loyal, supportive families. Uh, and then, like what we talked about before we started rolling this on this episode, wherever you go, they go. You oh, go yeah. as a glow together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one thing about Polynesians in general is that like, it's, it's usually family over everything. And it doesn't mean like blood. It just yeah. means that like, if you, if you earn the respect of the family, then you are tied to our family for anything until you prove otherwise, pretty yeah. much. And so, like, whenever it came to, like, all my football games, this was even back in high school, I have never remembered a game 
maybe one out of my whole entire football career where my parents didn't show up because it was always like that. It was either for sure. It was always my parents, my brother, my sisters, my cousins, like friends that I grown up with, like they always shown up. And that was like one of the biggest things growing up is knowing that I'll always have my family there regardless of how hard anything was. And that's pretty much for any Polynesian family. That's, that's amazing. And again, the photos really prove that point that uh, you sent me and uh, you guys can all, whoever's watching here in Texas or across the country, uh, <laughs> the family, very, very decorated, a lot of smiles and uh, just grateful to be together. And I, you know, and I mentioned too, that whenever Pat was at Texas, you could always, you always, you knew where his family was. Usually mm. I always ran into them or I was behind them. In, in some <laughs> aspect, um, you you dreamed or dreamt of becoming a Longhorn, made it happen. I think you committed in 2013, and you ended up starting. Yeah, 45 of 48 games at Texas. Yeah, how do you summarize that? The the perspective of being becoming a Longhorn to how it ended at the Sugar Bowl and, and a win over Georgia. Oh man, like. It was one of the one of the best times of my life, just because I was able to do something that a lot of people wasn't able to do right. themselves. And so, like, like I said before, like a lot of it was just knowing how I grown up and the situations that I was put through before I was able to commit, and just knowing that all the hard work and all of that was to not go into this. So as soon as I stepped foot on that campus, it was just like go time. Like I had to go prove something. And I was just, it wasn't for anybody else. Like it was just for my parents. Because if it was one thing, it was just to show them that like, hey, all the things, all the all the nights, all the days that you have to like break your back in order for us to have food on our stomachs, a roof over our head, clothes on our back, will never go unnoticed. And so that's pretty much like what it was. And then going from watching Texas on TV to being in the uniform, running onto the field <laughs> to represent that team that you used to watch as a kid. It, it, it speaks a lot of volume as to like, you can, you can literally do anything as long as you want, as long as you really want it. And so like four years went by like that, like I, I blinked and boom, we're already in a like, sugar bowl play. It was just, like the greatest gift that possibly was ever bestowed upon me. And I will never, ever take that for granted. I think that's pretty profound if you ask me, because you think about you, you, you the lead up to it, you received the opportunity, you committed, those four years go by so quickly, and then you end your career with a statement game that really was, you know, nobody – Everybody was doubting Texas against mighty Georgia. Mm -hmm. We had to hear about it all week. And <laughs> the whole time we were in New Orleans and leading up to it, to all the changes that your group went through with Charlie, um, all the coordinators, the old line coaches. I mean, there was never really truly any stability. Tom Herman um, at Wick line. Had, I mean – I lose – I don't have enough fingers to, to mm -hmm. count the amount of changes that your group endured. I mean, how do you even remotely look at that and now apply it to life to figure out why all that happened? Like I said, I, I've never heard of a D1 program that ever went through the changes that I had to endure for four years. Because for me, it was just like, I committed on the Mac Brown. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I committed on the Mac Brown, and then the whole coaching change happened, cleared house, and then I'm going to coach strong for the first couple of years. Those were rough just because there was so much that happened, so much to adjust to, so much that would, like, that would get thrown at us, and we had to, like, adjust over it. Like, there, there, was, a, there was a lot of complicated situations that we had to endure. And so, like, for me, it was just, like, Everything that I went through, as far as like changes, as far as like adjusting, as far as like observing and just trying to make the best out of what what was thrown at us, 
that 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 helped me out in life so much because it was like you can have all these stuff thrown at you, but if you don't know how to keep your composure, then it will get to you. Yeah. Like that's pretty much what it is. And, and so like I'm grateful for all the things that happen, all the instability and all of that. Like I, I'm grateful for all of that because that pretty much helped me pave the way to like pretty much like how I handle everything in life. It, so, it, uh, did you you think um what you experienced when you see, I don't know how connected you are with any of the Trinity up and comers, or maybe you, you stopped by the high school because you're highly, you're forever highly respected there for a lifetime. But what would you tell some of these young guys going through recruiting either at Euless Trinity or anywhere that not just are eyeballing Texas, but what to expect and how to prepare one's mind to, because it's not, perceptions are not always reality and, and that's the same story in life mm -hmm. I, I think the best advice i can give them is just make the best of it out of any opportunity that, that comes your way because for me like i was i was very blessed to be able to have my first offer be texas wow like uh, I, I don't hear too much about people who have that type of offer for the first <laughs> time but like that, that comes with like hard work that comes with dedication that comes with like making sure that you're like either up in the morning or just staying late, like staying up late at night, like stuff like that, like will make or break an athlete whenever they have an opportunity. Cause, cause like realistically, everybody wants to go to D one. That's yeah. the dream. That's how, that's how they're going to work for it. But in reality, that's just not how it is. You get, you get given an opportunity. You take the opportunity and you make the best out of it because one thing I know is that a lot of successful football players didn't go to D1. A lot. Quite a, a few. A lot. Like, when I was at the Ravens, like, I I, I, met a, I met a couple of guys that didn't even go to, like, college. They had to go through, like, the whole semis and all of that. Like, oh, wow. Just to get to wow. where they were at. And I was just like, so you didn't go to, the tra like, the traditional, like, go to D1 college, ball out, start four years, and then get drafted and all of that? No. I'm talking about guys who, like, literally drive sleep in their cars and then just like drive up to any like football team and ask them to play and then yeah so it's like if you really are dreaming about playing football at the d1 level don't even, like don't even think about that just think of just playing football anywhere in general because a lot of people don't even have the opportunity to do so it's how badly you want it yeah it's how bad you want it now your group Obviously, you went through a lot, but you had quite a few characters in your in your class and, and team wise, you know, from uh, Brecken and one in particular, uh, Deshaun, who you got to play with professionally too, in Baltimore. You, yeah, I think you know where I'm going with this. Oh yeah, uh, you you know you don't pull up the the video. Oh my god! So <laughs> that I, I think that was that that was 15, right? 2015 in yeah. Waco. Yeah. All right. Oh, my God. So, Baylor was – they were good. You guys beat them. They had an injury, I think, at quarterback or something. Well, uh, you guys defensively uh, really were pinging on Baylor. They didn't like it. So, leading up to the – and it was a bench-clearing brawl. Well, Deshaun <laughs> was fighting air. And here's the story leading up – well, the, the snippet of it. Um, you and I had an interview leading up to the next time you guys went to Waco. But Deshaun needs to worry about one thing in particular, flying ghosts. Patrick Vahi, his offensive line teammate, describes that flying ghost that he thought Deshaun saw during the game two years ago in an altercation with the Baylor Bears. I asked him right after that game, I was like, what were you looking at? He was like, I, I swear I was looking at somebody. I was like, nobody was in front of you. So you sure? It's like the eye in the sky. Don't lie, bro. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Was is yeah. that? Do you still is that still brought up when you guys oh, get no. together? The, the, that hasn't been brought up until now. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember, I do know that a couple of guys. Uh, whenever I went up to to Baltimore. Definitely brought it up. <laughs> but ever since then, it really hasn't been brought up, but I always think about it. I was just like, man, that guy was ready. 
for anything. <laughs> if you notice, he had a whole area code around him. Nobody was around him. Yeah, he was like, clear space, clear space. Clear, clear uh, yeah, the yeah, Joker you already got space, man. <laughs> the Joker. Uh, God, you guys, you guys had a ton of talent. And, you know, I'm going to save it for the second segment because you guys had NFL talent. And mm -hmm. you know the criticism that Texas gets, and I, and I want somebody who played professionally like as you did to really uh, drive home that you, that that whole criticism is a bit much as far as judging a program. But when well, first off, we got I have a new we have a partnership with these guys. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're a user of Manscaped.com. Yeah, uh, the products. <laughs> um, We'll have some fun with it here shortly, but we got to pay homage because it's a this segment we like to call uh, "Manscaping in the Man Cave." Yeah, we're covering about every topic imaginable here at Man Stories Inside the Man Cave, including manscaping. Manscape.com is so popular that they have their own periodical, a newspaper. In their top headline, We Say Balls, is pretty popular nowadays. And, you know, they really attracted me so much so that I, I love the products. And they sent me this entire package I'm going to show you. Well, the premier products of this box I just showed you, the Performance Package 4.0, this bad boy, the Lawnmower 4.0. Take a listen. That is the sound of absolutely tremendous manscaping in the man cave. So today, as you're watching this episode, I encourage you to jump on to manscaped.com and look for the Performance Package 4.0. You'll get the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. It is smooth, and you just feel like a piece of silk afterwards and you feel clean personally i mean let me show you what i love the most right here the ball deodorant i know the light's a little bright here but the ball deodorant it smells like sweet mahogany and pheromones so yeah pat patty mounts uh 20 percent off Promo code MANCAVE20. Go to manscaped.com. Pick out uh, whatever uh, tools, products. I mean, they are expanding their line. I'm about to debut a new video. So, Vahe, I think you said that you are a user. What's your favorite product from manscaped.com? Uh, I think right now I have that, that razor. There's like a little razor that they had. I think it was really cheap. I think I only got it for like five bucks. Yeah, see? But that's a, that's it works handy. It's very, it's very Man, nice. Keep things smooth, clean, and oh, yeah. you know the, the ladies in their lives, they don't want to see a German black forest below the belt. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Facts. Facts. <laughs> um, before we move to uh, your man cave story, um, you, you had a career NFL, XFL, and then there was that beast COVID, which. We all dealt with it, but for a professional athlete, that it really broke some careers in a way that really interrupted things in such a way that I don't even know how to explain it because obviously I didn't experience it, but it was it was hard to watch because it was not only livelihoods, it was concern about finances mm -hmm. and whatnot. What was that experience like for you to which made you kind of pivot to think, of life after football. Yeah, so with COVID happening, that that right there, that's like PTSD right there because mm -hmm. before COVID took down the XFL, we we were in LA. Like we were living wow. life. So like at that time we were going to practices, we were going to games, you know, we we're balling out. Like the XFL to me was like high school football but for adults just because of the <laughs> energy. Yeah, cuz it was it was just because of the energy like you can go to practice, have so much fun. Like it wasn't so serious. Like, like we went out there, we had a lot of fun, and it showed on the field because a lot of people wanted to play because we knew it was fun. Yeah, 
like we knew that we can go out there and like let loose and then after the game we all like hang out we all hit the town all of that we were in long beach and so like my samoan family was out there so like we we're getting treated like right out there like we we're hanging out all the time we we're hitting bars left and right and so like whenever it came to covid i remember we a lot of the players were like hesitant about practicing because yeah of the distance like they always told us to keep six feet away from each other and so like a lot of players were like kind of like backing out from like practice and like they didn't want to go out there they didn't want to get exposed to covid because they thought it was just like aerial like like you walk outside you're gonna get covid that's pretty much what the mindset was yeah I remember. and so i was just like for me it was just like if a lot of these players weren't gonna go practice then i don't feel comfortable going out there and practicing as well and it wasn't because of COVID. It was just like, it, it's just the energy wasn't the same. It wasn't the same like aura that you had whenever we first go out there in the beginning of the season. And so like, I remember when we went out there, coach was like, if y'all don't take y'all butts out there and go out there and practice, and a lot of players were like really refusing not to go. Wow. And so we had a long talk after after that day, basically saying like, we don't know what's going to happen. They might pull the plug on the XFL just because of COVID is that, like getting bad and all of that. And so I think it was like a couple of days after that meeting, they ended up shutting down the whole entire XFL. And when that happened, a lot of players were panicking, like, oh, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? And it was just like, they're going to shut it down. But if it did get like brought back up, there were like 40 players that they can secure. So that if it does come back, those 40 players can go back to the to the XFL to their original teams. I kind of figured that wasn't going to be the case just because it was like, that was a very far-fetched statement. And I felt like they only said that to make a lot of players comfortable about what, about the situation. But a lot of players didn't even know what to do. Like, would they go back home? A lot of them, like, a lot of them didn't even, like, have parents. So, like, they didn't know where to go after that. Wow. Yeah, so, like, I was just like, hey. Like you can see like the, the the true concern in their face. And it wasn't pleasant to see because these are the guys that like you went through like camp through. These are the guys that you earned trust through. Like it's so, like you you wanted to do nothing but to help them. You know what I mean? And so like the only thing that you can do at that time was just give them words of affirmation. It was just like, hey, everything's gonna be all right, you know what I mean? We'll bounce back from this, like like stuff like that. Yeah. And like there's a couple guys that I played with up to this day, like We'll talk about it like, dang, we really wish that we were back in Long Beach going into practice in the 70-degree 70 de- 70 heat with cool breeze wind and all that. <laughs> but life happens. Like, that's just how it is. Like, there's nothing that we can do about it. And so, like, a lot of players, like I said, that was that scary part of, like, when you don't have football, you don't know what to do because that's all you know in your whole entire life. What have you figured out about yourself right now that – because, I mean – you're a smart guy. Uh, you have a UT education. You're connected. Big family. You had that football career, and the network there is um is endless. Have you have you figured out what direction you want to pivot? That because uh, I know you can go multiple directions with not only your talent, and your intelligence, and and obviously I think we all know it. Our network that that is vital to all of our success. Oh, yeah. Like, there was a lot of opportunities that I had whenever it came to, like, a career choice. But, like, one thing I knew for sure is that, like, I didn't want to sit behind a desk <laughs> the rest of my life. Especially if I was, like, especially with the degree I ended up getting, like, I, was, I didn't want to, like, sit there and just work my <clears throat> days away. You know what I mean? Like, the one thing I knew for sure was that, like, I love talking to people. I love learning about people. love learning their backstories. And I pretty much, whenever it comes to work, how can I help them work like, like effectively, like for the company, you know what I mean? Whatever company I was going to work for. But before that, before I decided to do that, I was just like, you know what? Let me, let me try something. And so I came up with this idea that like, I basically wanted to have a GameStop with a lounge. Ooh. And so like, after the XFL, I went through this whole vigorous process of like creating a team. And with this team, we, we basically came up with the idea of like, you know what? Now that COVID happened, what are people turning to? A lot of people, a lot of people, especially my age, are turning to games. Streaming was a big thing coming up. Uh, when people order something, 
online was a big thing that came up. I think Amazon blew up in the stocks whenever COVID came out. Sky high. The sky high. So, like, a lot of people that had stocks on Amazon, oh, my gosh, congratulations. I'm pretty sure you're set for a good while. Like, <laughs> and so, like, I was just like, you know what? It's a, it's a, it's a stretch, but let me try it. Because, like, one thing I did learn was, I want to say, like, managing a business while I was in college. Just because, like, a lot of the classes I took, like, required me to talk to people and just, like, help them, like, pretty much, gr- like, help them grow as individuals. And so, like, I was just like, you know what? I think this might be something I want to try. So that's what I ended up doing. It took me a team of 12. We ended up coming, with this, uh, coming up with this idea. We wanted to start a website first before we ever wanted to launch anything else. And so we came up with this, like, website name, X-Files Gaming. Uh, like, very simple. You know, it wasn't, like, some awkward name that it took forever to figure out. So we were like, all right, X-Files Gaming. What is this website going to consist of? And we're talking about, like, consoles from like all dating all the way back to like Nintendo 64s type oh. of thing you know what i mean like because people people play old school antique games oh and so like why not yes. sell it you know what i mean and so like we came up with like different things to put onto the website we we're going through the whole copyright uh thing and all of that so like there was a lot of stuff that went into it but one of the biggest things was what are the what like what are the prices like what are what is our budget you know what i mean and so, like, one of the things we came up with is we were like, we're going to spend no more than $15,000. Why? Because we can do so much with just $15,000, especially during COVID. Yeah. We wanted to open up a shop in Austin, literally in the middle of the city, because it was a tourist attraction, let alone it was a college campus. And so, like, I think the whole thought process was like, you know what? If I was in college and I just wanted to go somewhere, just hang out, not be at home all day because because of quarantine i wanted to go somewhere where i could just go chill hang out be with my friends yada 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 you know what i mean and so we want to we don't want to just contract deals with like contractors and all of that we had the whole game set we had a lot of like people who were like supporting us and all of that but then for me i may have screwed it up <laughs> just because there are so many legal documentations you're going to have to have in order to run a business, especially in Texas. And so I didn't know any of that. That didn't kind of backfired on me and we are still under a legal case right now. Oh yeah. It's not a bad thing. It's more like just making sure that I know what I have to do, but it's, it's taking forever just because it's like, Oh, small business wants to, Wants to like run a uh, business here in Texas. Yeah, they can wait. That's pretty much. So I was like, you know what? I can wait for however long it's going to take. But until then, I can't just sit here because it was like my money will be drained out by then. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Let me just go pick up a job until then. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I don't want to sit behind a desk because I was like, the number one thing I was getting offered was right. selling insurance. And I was like, hmm, it seems nice, but. I can't do that like that. I, I just can't do it. It's tough. Yeah. It, it, one thing is tough. And another thing is like, I don't want to go up to people and just sell them something. You know what I mean? I, I actually want to like genuinely help them. And so like, didn't end up like finding anything around there. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So I applied for Amazon. And the crazy <laughs> thing about that, I went in there for a tier one job and it ended up coming out as like a tier two or something like that. Like, I didn't even, like, go through the whole process. Like, I've been there for, like, six months, and I already got promoted up twice just because of the way I talk to people. And so, I like, I'm in, I'm in this little part of the warehouse. It was, like, ICQA. And basically, it's, like, quality control. Basically, quality control runs the whole entire warehouse. And what I do is making sure that everybody is doing their thing. So I go around, talk to people. Like, if they're okay, is there anything I can do to help you just so you work effectively? Like, stuff like that. And I kind of like it because a lot of people do look towards me for issues. Like, if something's going on, they're going to be like, hey, this is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, you know what? Here's the best thing I can do for you. And then, boom, handle the situation. And so, like, that right there was like, I like that. Yeah. That's we have true. Op- yeah. That's true yeah. management skills right there. And you learn that. People, I mean, that's, I think, people who are leaders on the football field or any kind of athletics, 
you, you, you have those natural abilities to manage people. Mm -hmm. And so doing all of that and just seeing like how everything works out, it's just like, you know what? I can be promoted fairly fast in a short amount of time that I've been here. So who knows how high I could be in this situation. So uh, that's, that's basically what it is. I'm just trying to see how high I can go in the ranks and just uh, like pretty much just have fun with it. And so far it's actually been a good experience just because a lot of people are meeting their backstory and just seeing like, how, like what was their purpose to show up to Amazon? Because yeah. I've heard so many like, goods and bads about Amazon, but actually being in it, it's like very understandable for like a lot of people. So like, it's actually a good experience. And Amazon's they they have their own culture. Oh yeah, it's a, what the Am they call it the Amazonian vibe or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Amazonians. Amazonians. Yeah. That uh, man, that's a. I, I have no doubt you're going to continue to climb up the uh, corporate ladder, so to speak, until uh, the entrepreneurial ideas follow through, and especially the one with the GameStop Cafe type situation. <laughs> That's kind of that's unique. That that is right up your alley. I, I would imagine that's going to be one of many ideas that that are going to happen for you. Oh yeah, yeah. See, <laughs> oh yeah. I got I got I got some things cooking up here, but until then, I'm just going to ride this Amazon thing out. Keep the ideas to yourself so no one thieves it. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the best part of segment one, even your guy Gerard Heard had a great man cave story, which is brought to you by are brought to us by Jim Saxon State Farm Insurance Agency. Former Longhorn, his dad was a Heisman finalist at Texas. Um, but this guy is, uh, has been insuring Austin for almost three decades. And you talk about when you need something insured, like for me, for example, I bought a new truck and mm. I called them. They had a new the new coverage within a half hour. So that tells you what we're working with. And it's uh, sent to the app on my phone. So then I was street legal. so <laughs> to speak. Now, if you were to select a man case story, it could be your time at Texas. It could be with the Ravens or a family event, some type of situation or story that you love, love telling that everyone cracks up constantly over. Oh, man. That's <laughs> I gotta go through years worth of stories. <laughs> That's a lot to think about. That is a lot. That is a lot. I bet you, and to narrow it down to one, especially hmm. with those characters you had in that Texas locker room. Yeah, because that was, that was, that was like the one thing I'm thinking about. It's like I had a lot of funny <laughs> times at Texas. I like drawing a playground. Well, I will say, I will say one of the stories that I do remember it involved me with the online. And we like, we like, every time I meet up with some of the online that I used to play with, we always talk about it just because of like the stupidity of me. <laughs> <laughs> we, this was like during fall camp. And this was my senior year. No, my junior year. This is, the, this is my fall camp. This is when Herman first showed up to the scene. And he was big on hydration. Like, <laughs> the pizza. Huge, huge on hydration. Like, we will have PTSD drinking water type of thing. Like, <laughs> like it was crazy. And so I remember during fall camp. Um, oh, gosh, even more PTSD fall camp. We used to have these things. But, like, we'll wake up at, like, our day usually starts at 445. At least before my alarm, it'll be at 445. We'll sleep around the facility because, like, it's very convenient. You can just wake up, get up, and then go take your test, and then, boom, you're back. Like, you're at practice. I remember one time I used to carry literally the big blue bottles that you would put into, the like, the water dispensers just because, like, I remember I failed one time, and my whole group got punished for it. Oh. Yeah. It was <laughs> So I was just like, damn, you know what? I'm going to make sure I don't fill this. So I carried literally the big old handle blue jugs. And I was like, I'm talking about like two two meetings, after meetings, two breakfasts, after breakfast. Like, it was just on me the whole entire time. People looked at me crazy. I was just like, you know what? I'll be, I'll be, I'll be damned if I fail this again and have everybody get in trouble because of my, 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 my mess up. <laughs> 
So I was like, you know what? So I remember I like I took it after practice. I was holding it, went to go eat. Everybody started like, oh, put that away, put that away. You don't need that. Just carry like a regular gal. I was like, no, 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 no. I got this. So I remember I went to go sleep inside the academic room. And this is like one of like the most quietest, darkest places you can sleep in. So I remember I just, I chugged it. Like I'm talking about like, I'm pretty sure majority of it that night. And I remember I used to get up during my sleep so I can go use the restroom because all that water, it was just like running right through me. And I remember I went to sleep roughly around like midnight and I got up at three, went to the restroom, came back, went to sleep again. I was like, you know what? I got like an hour and a half. I'm good. Woke up 30 minutes after meetings already started. And I still had to go take the test. And by that time, I didn't even have enough water for me to pass pass that test. So I failed the test, was late to meetings. God. Wasn't even fully dressed when I showed up to the meeting room. And I remember Coach Warheim gave me the weirdest look. I was like, are you serious? But at that time, when I walked into the meeting room, he was already telling a story. He does this thing where he starts that meeting with stories and all that. And he was like, you know what? Nah, sit down. Because the last thing you're going to do is ruin my story. <laughs> so awkwardly, I had to sit there while everybody in the room knew that we we're all going to do punishment because I was late, failed the test, and wasn't even ready. He finished the story, and he was just like, you know what? Everybody in the hallway. And I was like, ah. Oh. Day. Everyone was doing push ups, and I was he didn't even make me do it. He had me stand there and stare and look at everybody, which was even worse. Oh, than doing punishments guilty. with him. I was just like, dang, dude. And all I remember was all this bickering on the side, like people were yelling at each other. And I was just like, dang, I feel hell bad. I was just like, you know what? Come on, guys, I got this. You know, I'll try to support. It wasn't helping at all, it was making the situation even worse. <laughs> I remember we had this player named TC. TC was one of those old heads on the team that was just like, didn't care what you thought. (laughs) And then we had Shaq, Shackleford. He was one of those, like, one of those leader-based people because his family was based around the military. So, like, he had that natural leadership in him. Shaq was getting on to me. TC was getting on to Shaq because Shaq kept talking and it was bugging TC. And then they should know Shaq and TC were face to face. And then hands were being thrown. I was just like, oh my God. I was just like, this is all my fault. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. Got back into the meeting room, just straight quiet forever. And I was just like, I can't. Uh, it's just, I just feel bad. And uh, even up to this day, we always mention it like, Hey, Pat, you still carry around that big blue jug? I'm like, screw <laughs> off. I'm like, screw <laughs> off, man. Leave me alone. Let me live. I tried my best. <laughs> oh, man. That's one of those. What was it? What, would you consider that a teachable moment? <laughs> Very. My, my biggest takeaway from that is never carry a big blue jug. <laughs> Ever. It's not worth it. I'm really disappointed that Tom Herman's P chart is not framed behind you. <laughs> Trust me, it's instilled in my brain. <laughs> I wake up every morning making sure I'm pissing excellence in, in his words. Pissing excellence. That's that, how he plays it. That, I love it. That is golden Patrick Vahe <laughs> right there. That's that's why we're here today. Vahe's golden, golden soundbite, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> man, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears if you know we're gonna take a quick break. Speaking oh, of yeah. speaking of taking a piss, you know. You got you to go. Uh, on the other side, you'll like this. A certain offensive lineman who is a rookie for the Cowboys spoke his mind like the Patrick Bahe would and in, in an entertaining way. Um, and then we'll check in on see what, what some opinions, some facts, what's fiction with the Longhorns, and that is coming up on the other side of this quick break. Hey y'all, Kevin Hutchison here with Realty Austin and I am grateful to be a part of Stories Inside the Man Cave. 
a homegrown podcast just like my own business. This is JJ Gotch, CEO of the Austin Gamblers. And segment two of Stories Inside the Man Cave is next. Well, I try to stay away from the media, definitely. I feel like, you know, everybody has an opinion. It's like, you know, like buttholes, you know, everybody has one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, was that was? Am I wrong? I mean, I think that uh, that may be something Patrick Bahe would say as a Longhorn. If uh, someone asked you about what people in the media are saying, you, you remember those days? It wasn't that long ago. Oh yeah, I I was always asked many, 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 many questions. <laughs> but stuff like that, the way that he responded, I commend him on that one. That was well done. That was well, well done. done. <laughs> Tyler Smith. Hey, this segment two is brought to you by FarmhouseDelivery.com. It's an ATX-based uh, company which harvests uh, Texas-grown produce, organic, and harvests Texas-raised uh, beef, meats uh, from Texas ranches. And it's pretty simple. But, hey, I, I have become... You're going to laugh at this one. I've become a fan of the eggplant. I know that's absolutely hilarious because of the emoji on uh, on texting um, through Farmhouse Delivery. It's pretty simple. FarmhouseDelivery.com. Select what you want. and But be sure to use that promo code. It's two words. Man Cave. 20% off your first order. And I, I, don't, I have to find out if they have that where you are in DFW. I'm not sure. But I'll, I'll find out for you. They do? Okay. Yeah, I have so, to see if they do. You saw Tyler Smith drafted in the first round. You know the Cowboys need linemen. Mm-hmm. Being an old lineman yourself, your thoughts on him? Because all I keep hearing was, I mean, the guy is physical. Right. And he's what they need. He needs some mean streak. But everyone keeps pointing out how many penalties he racked up last year. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you know a lot about him, but uh, what are your thoughts on the Cowboys picking up Tyler Smith? Well, I did see some highlights and pretty much like some interviews with him. Um, he seems like a really good kid. Like he seems like he's ready to go. And like you said, the Cowboys do need some, do need some, you know, um, younger guys up on the line so they can have uh, help them develop. But like, I think one thing's for sure, I wouldn't doubt his physicality. Especially his mentality when he's on the field. When it comes to the penalties, man, it's it's hard to stay away from those just because so many rules have changed playing as an offensive lineman. So like you can you can get a penalty for for spitting before the yeah. play. Nowadays, like, you know what I mean, and they call it a false start. You know what I mean? Because I remember I racked up a good amount of penalties whenever I was playing. I think it was my sophomore year. And it was just because, like, I had this tendency of, like, right before the play, it was, like, snap. I always look up, and they call it a false start. And so, like, when it comes to holding, it's, like, if it's not, in, like, right at their chest plate, then it's, like, it's holding. But it's, like, there's so many, like, techniques and, like, like so many pinpoints that you have to remember as playing as offensive linemen. But one thing that's never going to be taken away from them is the physicality. I feel like that's what he has. That is something that the Cowboys – I'm not saying last year was a disaster. I mean, they had a, a – I thought they had a pretty good year. Do um, you think that's what they're lacking to take that next step where everyone – because, I mean, we've had our hearts broken as Cowboy fans since 1996. Des did catch that, by the way. He caught it. But that was the year I thought they should have gone to the Super Bowl. But you haven't had much time to really – uh analyze professional football outs because you've been playing it for a while now mm-hmm. and but from what you've seen from the cowboys <clears throat> how close do you think they are from an offensive lineman's point of view in my opinion i feel like there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um just because it's like you're having a lot of vets start getting hurt and if there's one thing I know about playing football is that if your star players are hurt, you better have a strong backup. Because it's always the, if one man goes down, it's always the next man up. That's yeah. that's the mentality of offensive line. And that's why we're always hard on for making sure that we know how to play multiple positions. Because that was one thing I, I was always told, like going into the draft, 
Learn how to play center. Learn how to play a little bit of tackle. Learn how to play the other side that you're not comfortable with because you never know. Whenever you get signed on, you might have to play all those positions. That's literally what ended up happening. I had to play center. I had to play guard. I had to play I – don't, I don't think I played tackle. I think I played it a couple times. But, like, like my point being is, like, you got to know all of it. And I feel like right now, whenever they drafted him, I feel like that's a good start. Yeah. But it's still yeah. a lot of work. So, that, no, I think it's a good start. And so before we talk about your Longhorns and where they are now, the one piece of criticism that I have I keep hearing, and I get it, I understand it, people are judged by surface-level statistics, it's the lack of people drafted by a program. Do you think that it, from a player's point of view, is that a, is that a realistic – criteria to judge a program by the by not having anyone drafted i mean i mean it's i get it from the people who say that but i if you go deeper than that okay there are a ton of free agents from texas who have made nfl rosters mm -hmm. that's my point and i'm not yeah. just saying that because you chose a similar route you know i mean mm -hmm. it's i mean and, and what's your perspective on that i think with that one uh, it's funny that you said that because I've seen I got, I'm on the TikTok platform a lot of the times Right. Um, make sure y'all follow me on TikTok but I remember seeing this this video on there about this lady who she was like a news reporter she ended up reporting about like oh well how many uh, Texas players were drafted in the league zero is Texas ever going to be back no and I was just like it, it's it's one thing to judge somebody or judge a program off of how many players they draft. But it's another thing to see how far those undraftees and like all those opportunists end up like making it to the league. Because I don't believe that the draft for, for a pro I feel like the draft for a program is good because it, it brings in more recruits. Right. Cause it's like, it's like the more players you draft, it's like the more players that you can get. Alabama, for example. Yeah. Alabama is like a prime example of that. You, you, you send off, players to the league that's the promise that coaches are making to the recruits coming in and so like for texas it's like i wouldn't say they're, they're able to keep that promise but the one thing i can say is that they are good at having players that they bring in work their butts off to get to the next level and stay up there because it's like one thing's for sure football is not forever but the way that they're working the worth i think is going to take them farther in football than anybody else that were drafted in like the first round, second round, yada yada, because yeah. they won't they won't be the story of, oh, who is the draft bust of this year? Because I will tell you, it's a lot of D one programs that ended up being draft bust going into the league. But one thing I can say is that whenever you have a free agent that goes into the league and makes it big, that's the number one story that coaches are going to tell their recruits whenever they come up. You can be so, that guy. You can be that guy. It's just it's just all based on what the player really wants to do. Now, to appease those who want to see more draft picks, I mean, there's a lot of talent coming through the pipeline right now, which are younger and some of the uh, guys who will be counted on at Texas. But mm -hmm. this is uh, – before we get your take on them, this is Coach Sarkeesian up on the Longhorn Network after um, the spring game, uh, I believe, two Saturdays ago. I'll, I'll be honest with you, though, like for winter conditioning through spring practice, where we're at as a team, you know, collectively playing as one about the team first mentality, I think has been such a difference from where we were a year ago. Now, obviously, staff continuity, you know, schematically, development of players, all those things have progressed to make that happen. Uh, but where we are just as a football team, the culture, what we're about today, as opposed to a year ago this time, it, it's not even close. Okay, so you were recruited by Mac, played for Charlie. You saw what it was like under Tom Herman. You've seen a lot. I mean, yeah. honestly, Vahe, you've seen a lot. Yeah. What's your vibe with Coach Sark? Uh, I think he's a great coach. I mean, he came from a very respectable program. Yeah. So that's one thing that you can't take, a, take away from this is, is his credibility. He transforms players left and right, and he's trying to change a whole program that people have been doubting for many years. So it's like, it's like, 
it's it's a great opportunity for him just to show how great he is as well as how great Texas can be. Is the one thing I can say is that we have a lot, a lot, a lot of talent at Texas. He's just trying to figure out how to utilize it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's not like he's been there for 10 years and still trying to figure it out. He's just starting. But yet, the thing about Texas, especially as a head coach, you will get ridiculed for all of the stats that pop up, not for all the work that they're putting in. And it, it, it kills me because it's like, as a player, you want success. Yeah. You want success for the person that you played next to as well as the person guiding you. You know what I mean? And so I, I always give my 100% commend to, like, Coach Strong and Coach Herman because they, they're doing stuff that a lot of coaches wouldn't even take. They'll take, it because like, they'll take it because, like, money. But, like, these guys are actually taking it so that they can prove something to, like, a, a state. <laughs> you know what I mean? As well as, like, a, a whole, like, continent. Like, Texas is good. We just got to figure out what's stopping them from being great. You know what I mean? And it boils down to a lot. It comes down to the players. It comes down to the staff. It comes down to the coaches. It comes down to the head coach. It's a whole pyramid scheme. Because it's like, if the head coach is not fully invested, neither are the players. Neither are the coaches. And you guys can feel it as a player, right? You you know, without them saying anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, we know if it's going to be a bad day just because of the coach. But, like, the crazy thing was, it was like, but Coach Ron, he was a player's coach. You know what I mean? So, like, if if we were like, oh, man, man, my back is hurting. Coach, we're tired. Fall camp is killing. Coach would actually go out of his way just to make sure that we're all taken care of leading into season. But what sucks is that when we do get into season, the stats doesn't prove that. The stats will never prove how hard you worked. And that's, that's, that's like, that's pretty much like the underline of, like, playing football. Stats are only going to show you as much. They'll never show you the days you have to wake up, go into workouts, blood, sweat, tears, all of that. Like, I'm talking about guys passing out, like, because of, like, heat, because of overworking their bodies. Like, nobody's ever going to see that. All they're going to see is 5'7", five, 5'7". Seven, five, seven. And then they should know, like, 7'5". And then they should know, like, Sugar Bowl. That's what they're going to see. And then whenever you brought, bring in, like, a coach like Shark, they're just going to see the stats. They're not going to see, like, all the work and dedication that he's putting into it, which is... Uh, ugly, ugly demeanor of a picture for a coach. But that's just how it is. That's how people look at it. If you're not, if you're not bringing stats, then to them it's like, what? What's the use of you? And it's, it's dumb, in my opinion. It's dumb. very, very dumb. Results, records, championships. You know, it's people judge way too much. Oh, uh, that's well the criteria. That's just how it is. The fact of reality, you you got to win nowadays quickly. Um, you've seen what he's done with the roster, and he's handled mm-hmm. it with grace, in my opinion. Um, it's not easy. Almost half the roster will be new. Yeah, for this season, I've never seen yeah. anything like that. Have you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what does no. that tell you as a player? If you're a returning player, a senior. What is what what is your mindset going into that? And you're seeing half of the team are people you don't know. It's like it's like playing in a whole different league. Because for me, it's like whenever I was playing, I was always used to seeing the same guys every day. Yeah. Like sometimes I get sick of seeing their face. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like imagine waking up four years in a row. Listening to Chris Boyd's loud, loud butt in the locker room. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like stuff like that. Like, granted, I, I love Chris Boyd. You know what I mean? But it's like that stuff right there is what builds a team. The chemistry, the times that like you can like go to war and know it's the same person over and over and over again. And then whenever you bring in somebody new, it's like training. Yeah. It's like you got you got to learn this person. I figure out what their motives are. You got to figure out if they're really going to write for you or not. You know what I mean? Because it's one thing, like, if it's, like, on the field and you're starting to learn a person, it's off the field that makes the chemistry. 100%. Because, like, I remember I used to, like, after practice and all that, we used to all just sit in the locker room for hours just talking, laughing it up, capping on each other. Like, like stuff like that, those 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 are the real chemistry makers, in a, like, for a team. And so, like, seeing half the players – 
you don't even know them, then it's like, ah, it's like, so what do you, what's your favorite color? <laughs> like, like, like stuff yeah. like that. You have no idea. No, no. It's, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but have you, have you been around the, any of these guys lately or in the, within mm. the past year or recently? No, no, okay. no, just, I think it's just because like, I really haven't had, I want to say motors. I just really haven't had the time yeah. or like to make it out to the campus and all that. Cause a lot of the people I hang out with right now, they're off the campus. So like, yeah. never really had anything like, Hey, let's go to the campus. Cause all of the people over there, like I know like a good handful, but like, I don't know anybody over there, especially with like uh sharks and the crew that came in. They don't know me. Yeah. They probably heard of me, but they don't know me. I think one good thing about them, they have, from what I can tell, they have reached out. They they they're open arms about the former players, mm. which is good, and I think yeah. that's going to be good for you guys, especially you know a group like yours, you know. Mm. And it's for the guys who won that Sugar Bowl. Now, before we wrap it up, man, I, I've got to ask you about this. This you missed it by a year or two or three. That oh boy oh man trust me you, you talk about you talk about how players need to get paid now that's exactly what that is oh my gosh when i the one thing that i've always vouched for whenever it came to to building a name because that was that was like the biggest thing that we always talked about was building a name right i was just like i was always on i was on that team that was just vouching for sponsorships because sponsorships can help not only the player but the program and whenever whenever it came out that they came out with that rule that like you know what let him get sponsored i wanted ice cream so loud you can ask like there's uh you guys jp i told jp about it i told a lot of other people that i grew up with about it i was just like you know how much money i can make i was like Lost money, lost money, but but I am very happy because that yeah. will bring a good amount of people who are willing to drive themselves further. Because if you're gonna have a sponsorship, you can't just go out there and look like a duck. You gotta, you gotta you work. Know what I mean, yeah, you gotta work, which is good because that just gives them an extra motivation to like, hey, we can rack up some money over here, and then we can like that. I guess I don't want to say like you can live the life. That a lot of players dreamed about having in college. Because when that came out, I remember somebody like signed like a five hundred thousand dollar deal with Nike, and I was like, I could have been with Head and Shoulders. <laughs> Look at this. See that it's it's a versatile. You have a versatile head of hair. Yeah, one hundred percent. I can see the pretend shower. The visual, like the pretending of uh, he's in the shower, that big smile and that, and the hair. You know, Patrick with the Mahomes flex will on. never have anything on me. Marketing 101. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember I used to talk to uh, K Wash about it. Uh, he was like, he, he was one of the player development uh, people on the staff. Good guy. And he, we were just talking about it. We were just like, you know what? We, we got we to gotta put our name out there and all of that. We got to put our name out there. As soon as I got to Baltimore, I had I remember, or it was before I got to Baltimore. Um, I, we're we're just done talking about like building a brand, and so like I was like, you know what, my brand is my hair. Everybody knows me about my hair. You you watch the games, you know which one is me. I was like, you know what, let me let me reach out to Head and Shoulders. Let me see what they can do for me. And I hit them up during study hall hours. Sorry, academics. During study hall hours, <clears throat> and I remember they reached back out to me. On Twitter, they're like, "Hey, we would love to send you a care package." Like that little thing right there got me so hyped because I was like, "You know what? If they're able to do this, I can only imagine." Because we weren't doing sponsors at the time, right? I can only imagine what it'd be like if I was to ever make it out. You know what I mean? And that's what ended up happening. Went to Baltimore, did my thing, I hit them up again. They sent me a care package for like the next like month or so for however long I was out there in Baltimore, and I was like. This would have been awesome in college because not only would I be able to get products for like uh, me, I get products for like the locker room. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody. Because you're you're representing, you're a brand ambassador, so to speak. Yeah, because 
We had Brecken that was on the team that had really good oh, hair as well. Yeah. We had a lot of players that had like different types of hairs, but they were all really good. Hey, what like, do you oh, that's awesome. You and Brecken, the, the, the dual sponsorship. I can see it. Um so so Brecken, that you talk about a guy who is it does it shock you the route he's taking? He's kind of gone Hollywood on us. No, no, I'm not I'm not surprised at all. No, I'm not Brecken always had his mindset. Yeah, Brecken had this this idea, and he basically lived with it throughout college, and he's making it happen now. Like I, I can't blame the guy. Like <laughs> that's like that's like wanting to do something and actually doing it. Like it's one thing to talk about it and not do anything about it, but he actually he did it, it while we were playing, going through all those dog days. Like he he actually ended up living out his dream, which is amazing. The guy. A lot of people don't. Now you talk about misunderstood. That guy is much. He's a brilliant guy. Very brilliant. When I say he he had all the attraction on him, it wasn't even like unwanted or diverse attraction. It was like the right amount of attraction and the to the right people. Literally, the whole state of Texas was just like, "What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> What's wrong with him? He's a he's an actor now, like." <laughs> Doing what he he's, wants to do. He's doing what he wants to do. He had the public name, and then he did he did what he had to do with that name, and he's doing amazing with that. You, Can't blame the guy. He he knows how to appeal to his audience. Uh, uh, exactly. You, you remember before your senior year, before the OU game, uh, it was I forgot who you guys beat. It was in Austin, and of course we set him up. He knew what we were about to do. And uh, Bob Ballou at KI said, hey, and I looked, I said something, and then Bob said, Brecken, what time is it? And Brecken looks at the clock across the, uh, what was it, in, in Moncrief and says, looks like it's about 11.39 and OU still sucks. Mm-hmm. And he, <laughs> he, knew, he knew his audience. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That was Brecken for you. I mean, uh, I loved it because you guys, I know, were told what not to say. And that was definitely not that. Not, and that it was, was the, uh, Yeah, but I will say we did have a lot of characters. So, like, you you never knew what to expect when it came to to interview. <laughs> like, you saw the Big 12 media today, like, Brecken was himself. Nobody could stop him. Unplug. 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 That's Brecken. That's Brecken. <laughs> hey. With all the negativity in the world, this is one thing that I started when this was all uh, uh, an audio podcast before it went to uh, uh, the video platform. This was during the lockdown, but it's carried through. We got to end on something positive. Hey, Ben, tell me something good. <laughs> tell me something good. Sponsored by our guy, Kevin Hutchison. Just uh, give Hutch when you're, t- when you're ready to buy a house. Even you, Vahe, I'll, I'll, I'll connect you too when you're ready for some real estate. I got you covered, bro. Appreciate Tell me you. something good in your world or what you see. Because if you go on social media, you would think that there is it's just negativity. Nothing good is happening. Nothing positive. That's far from the truth. Oh, yeah. I've um, been thinking about this for a while. Um, it's more like my observation, just giving out to a younger audience that are like playing ball right now or like doing what they love. The best thing I could tell you, especially at a time like this, is that there's no clear cut destination for you. The best thing I could tell you is live your life the way you want to live it. Do what makes you happy and make sure that whenever you're doing it for somebody else, that you're also doing it for yourself. Because the one thing that nobody can ever take away from you is your own soul. So, Whenever you go about your day, whenever you go about your nights, whenever you go about your your week, just always think to yourself, as long as I'm happy, that's all that matters. Because as long as you're happy, everybody that supports you, everybody that loves you will be happy for you. Don't think that you have to force yourself to be a person just to make somebody else happy. It's a it's a very it hurts as a disease. And it's something that usually is hard to bounce back from because you tend to lose yourself in that moment. Stay stay true to yourself. Whenever you go, like it doesn't matter if you like to draw. It doesn't matter if you like to sing. Do what makes you happy because this time of age, everybody is doing anything. And like I said, there's no destination. So whatever you like to do, do it. If it's not playing any, like if it's not playing any sports, 
don't play sports just because that's what social media is telling you to do. Don't even listen to social media. Listen to yourself. Sage advice from the the best hair, perhaps, to ever <laughs> have been uh, worn or uh, natural hair by any Longhorn in any sport. Breck and Hager <laughs> may argue with you on that. Oh, yeah, we could argue anytime. I'm ready for that today. <laughs> Big 12 media days that year, you guys, that was absolutely – did you guys plan in, what was it, 2018, Big 12 media days to wear it out? No. It, it just happened that way. It just happened. Everybody was like, who had better hair? You were brecking. I was like, I always gave it a brecking. You know, just try to be the, the bigger guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, back to what you said, telling me something good. Be yourself. Be true to you. There's only one of each of us. There's one of you listening, one of you watching. Exactly. Vahe's nailed it. Absolutely <laughs> nailed it. You get one chance at this. Do what you do. You. Exactly. And, brother, I appreciate you. I really do, making the time for this. I'm proud of you. Appreciate you. Thank you so Man. much. We're going to do it again. And now, you know, you can celebrate. If you want to put this on your resume, you're more than welcome to. I'll be a reference. Uh, <laughs> Patrick Vahe is now uh, Stories Inside the Man Cave VIP alumni. Oh, I love it. That's a whole line on list of accomplishments in your on your resume. <laughs> That's going on my resume. You think I'm playing just right. References to be determined or will be furnished upon request. That's what everyone says. Sounds good with me. Hey, <laughs> for the OG Man K boys, Big Mike, Coach Mo, and Hardball Harge, and now the VIP alumni himself, Pat Vahi. We, <laughs> we are out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. I'm in my car in the giddy up.